Good morning. Welcome to Mark Street Baptist Church to our worship service this morning. And this is a special Sunday, of course. This is Palm Sunday, if you haven't noticed from the palms in the back. And you're certainly, if you haven't taken one, uh, you're welcome to take one as you leave today. A uh, special welcome to those also who are watching at home from Facebook. So glad that you can join us. And again, you can download our uh, bulletin for the service today from our website at msbcnews.org. And uh, you can find in there the sermon notes, the songs, and we hope that you'll be worshiping with us this morning. Just to call your attention to a few things, uh, in your bulletin, as always, there is a connection card. If you are visiting with us today and would like to be in our mailing list, you can feel free to fill out your information and place it in the white box at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, there's also a line there for any prayer requests that you might have, and we pray, this is for all of us here, if you uh, have any needs that you'd like the church to be aware of, anything that we can pray for, uh, please let us know. If you want to keep it more confidential, you can just check the elders only, and we'll be praying for you. If you want the whole church to know, please check that box, and we'll be pleased to pass it on. Um, we have several meetings throughout the week, as you'll see, in the bulletin as well, where we devote ourselves to prayer, and we hope that you can take advantage of that. And also, if you have any tithes or offerings during the service, uh, at, before you leave, if you wish to, to give them to the church, you can place it in the white box. And those who are watching online, you can, you can give through the website as well. Again, that's msbcnews.org. But at this time, I'd like to turn your attention to the back of our bulletin, to our responsive reading. This is taken from Psalm 118. And after a moment of silence, as we prepare our hearts, uh, Mark will be leading us in our responsive reading and opening prayer. But let us take a moment to quiet ourselves and to prepare for worship together. I'll give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Out of my distress, I call to the Lord. The Lord is indeed set me free. The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, we give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Please bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are good and merciful, just and faithful. We call on you in our times of need, and you answer us. You provide all good things for your people. All that we have, all that we are comes from you. Our very lives come from you. Your strength is shown in our weakness. All things are possible when we rely, when we rely on your strength and not our own. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you are good. Your love endures forever. We go into the, word, the world to spread your word, and when we meet opposition, we need not fear, because you will be there with us to hold us up, to save us, and grant us success. It is freeing to know that it is not us who save. We are to spread your word. It is Jesus who saves. Knowing this sets us free from worry and fear of failing you. Please shine your light on every Christian here today. 
We pray that your light will shine through us to every part of this community. We give thanks, we give you thanks for the faithfulness and love shown to us. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand and grab your hymnals and turn to hymn number 221, Hosanna, loud Hosanna.
Good morning. Today's reading is from the book of Matthew. It's chapter 21, verses 1 through 17, and it's found on 1049 of your pew Bibles. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble, and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Now will you join me in our prayer of confession? <clears throat> Father God, thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the work that he accomplished on the cross, enabling us to find forgiveness for our sins as they are nailed to the cross with him. Father, we confess that we do not always do the things we should, say the things we should, or think the way you want us to. Please forgive us when we sin against you, our holy, almighty God. Please give us more faith and strength to become the people that you created us to be. Thank you, Father God, for your love and mercy towards us. We don't deserve any of it. Thank you for being faithful to your promise to forgive us of our confessed sin. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Please stay seated, if you will, and turn to page 143 and sing with us, You Are My All in All.
The first scripture reading this week can be found on page 1211, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 31. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And the next reading is in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 through 40, and this can be found on page 1,284. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped to the, the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we do give you thanks and praise that we can gather together to sing of the glory of your salvation, the wonderful news we have received through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would give us faith now as we hear your word once again. Increase in us the trust that you require of us to place all to lean not on ourselves and our own understanding, but to trust in our Lord Jesus with all our heart. Bless this word to us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll continue through Hebrews chapter 11 on page 1284. We'll be looking this week, uh, verses 32 to 34 uh, in our passage. That's on page 1284 in your pew Bibles, Hebrews 11. I want you to go back in time with me, those of you who are here, and I hope most of you can remember that day when you first believed, when you first came to faith in Christ and experienced the joy of our salvation. Just remember that day when you learned and really experienced and believed that your sins that had been burdening you and the shame and the guilt that you felt was, was forgiven. The, the absolute joy of that forgiveness. 
and that the, what you, the future that you dreaded as you saw this just dark void, at best nothing, at worst what we deserve, the flames of hell, and to realize that Christ has come and died for us so we could be forgiven. He rose again, as we'll celebrate next week especially, and conquered death and grants to us eternal life. Just that hope and that joy that we experience. And it's just this mountaintop experience. We, we saw this year after year when we took kids to camp with us and they had a chance to really hear the good news. And, and many of them believed and it felt great. You're like a new person. It was just the lights had gone on. It was a new day, this mountaintop experience. And, and then soon after that, you know, didn't take too long when the feelings would fade a bit and the trials might come and it doesn't feel quite as good as it used to. You feel a sense of loss. Perhaps sometimes you realize you may lose some friends because of your new faith and things don't go as well and, and you find out that while God has forgiven your sins, he hasn't taken away your problems. They sort of remain and we go back into the world, and, and many we saw as well with the camps that we went fell away during that time. They gave it a try. We gave it a try, right? But it's just not working. It's not working for us. It doesn't feel right anymore. And they would abandon the faith and pursue something that felt a little better for them. And this is a challenge that we have. There's a lot of confusion because I've, it turns out we are an emotional people. Are we not? We are always making judgments about things based upon our feelings. I used to think we were a logical people and we could reason things out. We are not. We are completely an emotional. Even the, even the most intellectual of us, we are emotional people. The problem is, the scriptures tell us regarding our emotions, that the heart, you've heard that horrible advice, follow your heart, right? Just the worst advice ever. Every bad decision I've ever made was following my heart. And the scriptures warn us of that. It says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And the Proverbs says, there is a way that seems right. It feels right to a man, but it leads to death. And so and that's where faith and feelings really begin to be at war with one another. That there is a way that feels right, but is not. And sometimes faith, which is right, does not feel right. It does not feel natural. And so we want to consider, and, and it's, it's, it's not something I can sit here and explain to you and say, this is how you diagram this. There is, a, there is a feel to this as well of where it's really through examples and experiences that we really learn how faith works. And that's why Hebrews 11 doesn't just give us a definition of faith, which we saw at the beginning. Remember what faith is. Verse 1, faith is not a feeling that we have. Faith is a conviction. It's an assurance for things that we cannot see and for things that we are hoping for. And so it's, faith is always looking toward the future, not where we are right now. And it's a conviction concerning the future, not a feeling concerning the present. Let's be clear about that. And as you know, those two things are not always lined, aligned together. And so the question we have is, well, that's the definition, but then the writer of Hebrews determines that we're going to give you now example after example of faith so we can get a feel for this. And we're coming to the end of the chapter, and as if the 12 people that it mentioned before are not sufficient, he just, in the last paragraph, as he sums it all up, decides, just we're going to throw everything at you now. And we're going to give you not just one, but how about six? And maybe a whole bunch of nameless prophets as well to boot. We're just going to throw the whole book at you and say, this is what faith is, looks like and feels like. This is what we're going to look at today is the experience of faith and the expression of it. What does it feel like? What should it look like? And find that it doesn't match our expectations and that's important to remember because our feelings I'll say this again our feelings will always betray us they always will and we have to understand what faith really is about and so that's what we're going to take a look at today verses 32 to 34 he gives us now uh, 
six names of people that he wants us to consider. And you can read their stories. They're in the Bible. I've given you the verses for from the book of Judges, from the book of 1 Samuel. He mentions, what more shall I say for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets. So here we have, he gives to us four judges from the book of Judges, Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. And then he mentions the final judge, Samuel, who is the one who brings in the kingdom that God used to anoint the kings. And then David, who is not the first king of Israel, but he is the first really example of faith in a king. He is the, the premier example of one who is after God's own heart. So we have five judges, one king, and then he mentions and the prophets too, many prophets. And when we look at those names, it's a, if you read their stories, it's kind of a surprising list, especially the first four. I don't know if you, rem- if you know the stories of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. Some of you may sound familiar to you. If they're not, read them. Ju- Judges 4 to 8, 11 to 16, it won't take you long. Just a couple chapters. But they are shocking examples of faith. The first, Gideon and Barak, are really... I would say, Gideon, when he is approached by the angel and says, you need to lead now and bring Israel to victory over your enemies. And Gideon is doing everything he can to get out of this. I'm the least of my tribe, and my tribe is the least of the tribes. And just like, you're, you're, this is the wrong guy. I can't do this. And throughout the whole experience, he is continually afraid. And he asks for a sign. How about this? This is how I'll know, as if an angel appearing to you is not sufficient. How about I take this fleece and put it on the ground and... If the whole ground is full of dew and the fleece is dry, then I'll know that this is the Lord and I'll do it. And so it happens exactly that way. And he says, all right, let's do two out of three. Let's try it again. And this time, if it's the fleece is wet and the ground is dry, then I'll know. And the Lord does it again for him. And so he's so hesitant. He is so full of fear. And he's so flawed. And that's the thing about these guys, is they are fearful and flawed. In the book of Judges, these examples of faith are not inspiring characters. They are not the bold and the righteous. They are the fearful and the flawed. Gideon was like that. Barak was the same way. Barak was called by Deborah, the prophetess, to go, thus says the Lord, go take your army and defeat them, win the day. And he says, I'm only going to go if you go with me. And she's like, fine. I'll go with you, but you will not get the glory for this one. It's going to be a woman who gets the glory. And it was Jael who was the one who had the the honor of putting Sisera to death. Fearful, full of fear, these two. Yet, they had faith somehow. Hmm. Even more disturbing are the next two, Jephthah and Samson. You may not have heard much of Jephthah. There's a reason we do not tell Jephthah's story in Sunday school. He was the son of a prostitute, violent, ill-tempered, always just no one liked this man, and rash, reckless, to the point where he pledges to the Lord at the end, if you will give me victory, I will sacrifice whatever comes to greet me first when I come home. And it's his daughter who comes to him. I mean, this is a sad and tragic tale. Jephthah, really? Jephthah. There's only one worse than Jephthah. That's Samson. You know, he's a great hero because he's just so muscular and awesome. But the guy is, again, easily angered, ill-tempered, and promiscuous, um, just easily seduced and ends his life in that tragic scene of him shaved and blinded in in the temple and tied up amongst his enemies. He does bring the temple down by faith, um, but it's not a happy ending for these fearful and flawed men. These are our examples of faith, really. 
And then next are David and Samuel, and these are more palatable to us. David and Samuel, David's awesome, and he's amazing what he did through him, especially, particularly, you remember the story of David and Goliath? You know, just this, this boy, probably about 13 or so, going up against the giant, the nine-foot Goliath in full armor and sword, and, and David comes at him with just a, five smooth stones, no armor, nothing else, and kills him in one shot. That's amazing. And Samuel, too, was a great, great man. But in their situation, you know, Samuel comes at a time when Israel is at its lowest point. It has been declared Ichabod, the glory has departed because the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen from them. The first time in their history, the Ark where God's throne was to be in the tabernacle was gone and they had felt completely abandoned and Samuel comes and leads them in an unlikely victory. But in both cases of Samuel and David, we see not necessarily the fearful and flawed, they are both men bold, but overpowered and overwhelmed. These were not underdog stories. Let's be clear about that. These are not underdog stories. These are miracle stories. An underdog is when, you know, Oral Roberts makes it to the Sweet 16. That's an underdog. And they almost went to the Elite Eight, which would have never happened before, that someone so low rank could go. But that's still feasible. It's still possible. This is impossible. These are impossible situations. The David and Goliath story, if you come out of that thinking, oh, I could be like David and take on the giants of my life, you're not getting the story here, folks. It was an impossible scene. You do not send a boy against a an experienced man of war who's nine feet tall. You don't do that. That's not how this works. And then he just lists off the prophets. He doesn't list names. But further down, he gives some examples of the prophets he has in mind. Prophets like Daniel, who survived the lion's den, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who survived the power of the fire, or Elisha, who raised women, their, their sons from the dead. But one thing about all these prophets that you'll see if you read their stories is they are not the popular and loved prophets. They are the lonely and the exiled ones. Especially some of them like Jeremiah, who is just the prophet of sorrow and lament, just despised by his people. The lonely and the exiled. So here we have this picture of faith as we think of how a faith is supposed to feel. Well, we see fearful and flawed, overpowered, overwhelmed, lonely, and exiled, none of whom seem to be on the right track. None of this feels right. And yet, all of them were used to bring about great victories. And consider the triumph of their faith. He says to them, after listing their names, he says, consider what they did. Verse 33, by faith... By faith, through faith, these flawed men conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, and put foreign armies to flight. Look at what they, their faith did. God, through faith in them, accomplished great things first pertaining to God's kingdom and to his righteousness. They conquered kingdoms and they enforced justice pertaining to God's kingdom and righteousness. This, is, this was not about them achieving their dreams and meeting their career goals and potential by faith. They met their potential and lived happily ever. No. No, but by faith they advanced the kingdom of God conquering kingdoms and advance his righteousness enforcing justice that's how they did it like Gideon's men 300 men incredible story 300 men I won't tell you how it works but were armed with each a jar a torch and a trumpet 300 of them that's it and they were able to defeat perhaps countless, perhaps millions of violent and fierce soldiers in the valley. 300 men. Wow. It's an incredible scene. Absolutely incredible scene of how that works. Or Samson, who 
in a moment when the Spirit comes upon him, is being surrounded by a thousand Philistines and does something that even the great Rambo could never dream of doing. He takes the nearest weapon to him, the jawbone of a donkey, and he kills a thousand Philistine soldiers. Wow. This is what they accomplished, but this was all in the advancement of God's kingdom and righteousness as they, as they dealt blows to the enemies of God and brought deliverance to the people of God. And second is their faith, through faith, they received blessings pertaining to their hope and their salvation. It says here, they not only conquered kingdoms and enforced justice, but they obtained promises. Promises deal with hope that we have. They were given hope through them, like David, who was given the promise that they will never cease to be a king on your throne and your son will reign forever and ever. And we see that in Jesus Christ, the son of David. And delivered from all sorts of trouble. Look at their salvation. By faith, they survived the lion's den, like Daniel. They quenched the power of fire, like his friends. They escaped the edge of the sword, like Elijah, who went seeking to be arrested by a hundred soldiers, calls down fire from heaven. They became mighty in war. They put armies to flight. All of this, their deliverance. So this is what faith does. So faith, though it feels weak and pathetic, yet through faith accomplishes what God intends, the advancement of his kingdom and righteousness, and the hope and salvation of us, of his people, who trust in him. So what do we conclude from all these examples? The key verse I'd like you to see is in verse 34. There's a phrase that unlocks the key to all of this. In verse 34 it says, through faith they were made strong out of weakness. They were made strong out of weakness. Faith is powerful, but faith does not come out of strength. It comes out of weakness. We see that. They were made strong out of weakness. The reason all those men were mentioned before is you come away not inspired by them in any way. And that's the point. They're fearful, they're flawed, they're lonely, they're exiled, they're overpowered, they're overwhelmed. They are weak, weak in every way. Weak in physical strength, weak in emotional strength, weak spiritually. They are not moral giants either. They are weak and pathetic. But through faith are made strong. That's the picture here. So when we think about how faith feels, faith does not feel strong and wise, but faith feels weak and foolish. Faith is powerful, but it does not feel powerful. It feels weak. Faith and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but it does not feel wise. It feels foolish. That's why 1 Corinthians 1, which we read before that, speaks about that. How God did not choose the strong and the wise of this world. He didn't choose that. Did you get that? He chose us. He chose us. He didn't take the cream of the crop. He skims the bottom of the barrel is what he does. He chooses us. Not many of you were wise. He chose the foolish things. Not many of you were strong. He chose the weak things. Not many of you are rich. There's a few perhaps here and there, but no, he chooses the poor things. He chooses the things that are nothing. He does it all that way. And why does he do that? He says this. In fact, why don't you turn there with me so you don't have to take my word for it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is on page 12, 11, once again. Why does he do this? And he gives us the message of the cross which is foolishness, that if you want to be saved, if you want a great deliverer, look to the naked, crucified man. There's your Savior. Now that's foolish. That is foolish. But that's what we preach. Consider your calling. 
Verse 26, not many of you were wise, not many powerful, not many of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. That's why he does this. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong, what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why? Verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, verse 31, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the way of faith. Faith feels weak and foolish, and faith comes to the weak and the foolish like us. Because faith is not believing in myself. Faith is not believing in me and being confident in myself. That's not what faith is. I am not the object of my faith. Are we clear about that? Faith is believing in Christ. It's believing in God. It's trusting in Him. That's what faith is. What is the gospel we proclaim? What is that gospel? Is it a gospel of our own doing? Did we come up with the plan? Were we the ones who strategized this? How are we going to save mankind? Do we gather in big forums and and big councils and get the best and brightest of us to figure out a solution? How are we going to save mankind from our sin? How are we going to get back to God? No. It was God the Father who planned it all, who set it forth. It was God who loved the world. And so doing, he sent his son to work out the plan that he set. The father set the plan, and he sent the son to us. And the son came in the person of Jesus Christ, who did all the work for us. He lived the perfect life for us. He then offered himself the perfect sacrifice for our sin, taking all of our sin and shame upon himself. Dying in our place, he did that work for us, every bit of it. He then rose again by the power of God, conquering death for us. He ascended back to heaven, and he sits right now at the Father's right hand where he reigns as our king and serves as our priest, interceding for us every day. We stand and we live and we move because he is pleading our case and holding us together. And he will one day, as he promised, return to bring us to eternal life and glory. Did you get that? He does it all, every bit of it. We are not in the picture. It was not our wisdom that planned it out. It was the Lord's wisdom. It was not our works that accomplished this. It was the Lord's work. Why? Because faith is not about trusting in me. Faith is trusting in Christ alone. Christ alone. Not in our works and not in our wisdom. And that's why faith must feel weak and foolish. Because if faith felt strong, we would not trust in the Lord's strength. Now, would we? If faith faith felt smart, we would not trust in the Lord's wisdom. Now, would we? And so our weakness and foolishness is is not a disadvantage. It is an advantage for us. This is why the Lord afflicts us. This is why he doesn't let us spend too much time on that mountain and is pleased to knock us off and to bring us into distress. And you thought that once you get by this season of distress, things would be great, right? Until the next season comes. It is his plan because that's how faith works. Faith begins in weakness. We are made strong out of weakness. It does not begin in strength. So what does this mean for us? Well, we look at, this is Palm Sunday, and if you remember in Matthew 21, we don't need to turn there again, but if you read that scene again, you'll notice that there is a place where faith is seen and a place where it is not seen. So the Lord comes in, marches into the cheers of his followers, and he enters the temple, and he is resisted not by the tax collectors and the prostitutes, not by the troublemakers. He is resisted by the priests and the scribes. 
the priests and the scribes, the wise and the powerful and the righteous leaders of the people. These are the ones who reject Jesus as the son of David, as their savior. And they are the ones that he rebukes and even casts out of the temple. That's not where faith is seen. Faith is not seen in the righteous, powerful, wise places. That's not where it's seen. But who is it that came to him? When he goes to the temple, who was it that comes to him? If you remember, as you read it, it was the blind and the lame that came to him. And he healed them. And who was it that Jesus said that God, through them, spoke perfect praise but the infants and the babies that were crying out, the most annoying ones in your worship service are the ones singing perfect praise to Christ. The lame and the blind, the infants and the babies, they are the ones who get faith because they are the ones who are the most helpless and weak and pathetic of all, and they know they are not tempted for a second to trust in themselves. And so it becomes so easy for them to come to the Savior. And so it is with us. And that's why Jesus says, if you will not become like little children, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. If you will not become like little children and feel that need of a Savior, which is the last place we want to be. I hate feeling needy. I hate it. My pride rails against this. And that's why the biggest obstacle to my faith is my pride and my strength. And any talent or ability I might have is the biggest obstacle to my faith. And so now we also, I want to close with one verse. In Psalm 118, kind of explains the process of faith, in particular in worship and in prayer. And this is a helpful verse to memorize Psalm 118, verse 5, it says this, Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. That is how faith works. The first experience of faith is distress. Out of my distress, I cry out to the Lord. I called on the Lord. Distress over what? Well, like we saw with those great men of faith, distress over my own fears, my own flaws and sins, my shame, distress over being overwhelmed, overpowered, facing insurmountable foes, distress over my own loneliness and exile, my own being despised and rejected. Faith feels all of this, all of this distress, the grief, the loss, the sufferings of this life, all of it out of that distress but faith does not dwell in the distress it doesn't stay there but it's a springboard faith out of that distress does what calls on the lord out of distress faith calls on the lord faith doesn't turn inward and fall into self-pity and cries into its pillow but faith looks upward and calls on the lord Cast all our anxiety upon him. Do not be anxious about anything, but in prayer present your request to God. Faith comes to God. And that's what we're doing here. We gather together. We're each coming here together out of our distress, whatever it might be. In some weeks, we feel it more than others. But we're all coming out of this sinful world, out of our own sinful hearts, out of our own distress coming. And we're confessing our sins calling on the Lord for forgiveness, bringing our request to him, calling on the Lord for help and strength. Help us, O Lord. And out of my distress, I called on the Lord, and the Lord answered, and he set me free. Faith moves from distress to calling on the Lord, and then the Lord delivers. The next experience of faith is deliverance. He delivers us. If we confess our sins, He forgives our sins. How wonderful is that? If we cast all our cares upon Him, He gives us His peace. He takes our cares and anxieties. Again, 
He may not solve our problems. He may not change our circumstances. But he frees us from all fear and anxiety, which is what we really need. He frees us from all sin. That's the deliverance he promises. And that deliverance leads us to rejoice in the Lord. Really, there's there's really only two basic things we do. We're either calling on the Lord or rejoicing in the Lord. We're either confessing our sins and praying for his help or giving him thanks and praise for all that he's done for us and will do for us. That's pretty much how this goes. And this is not a one-time thing. You may have realized that. You thought it was just the moment you came to faith and then the rest of your life is rejoicing. Folks, this is, a, this is like a, a, a racetrack. We keep going around and around again. Same track until we're finished. Distress, we call on the Lord. He delivers us and frees us from our fear. We rejoice and give thanks and he puts us back in distress again so we'll call on him again. And each time we're going deeper and deeper and our faith is strengthened and our confidence and assurance of his word we become more bold and more joyful. That's how this works. That's the experience. So do not despair. I suspect if this is a normal Sunday, that a good third, half of us, are facing some measure of distress. Maybe all of us. Do not despair. And that weakness that you feel, and that grief, and that sorrow, when all feels wrong. Do not believe your heart. Believe his word. This distress is God's gracious design to drive you further into more fervent and sincere prayer, which will lead to a more joyful praise and glory that is truly pleasing to the Father and our Savior. Out of your distress, we call upon him. He will deliver us from all our sin and fear. And one day, we'll finish our final lap. And he will bring us safely home. And then, we will feel good forever. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your promises that are true. And we've experienced them again and again and again. Let us not falter now. Increase our faith. Enable us to stand firm. We cry out to you in our distress. And we believe your word is true, that you will answer. And in the name of Jesus and for his sake, you will deliver us from all our sins and fears. Bless each of us this day, we pray. Amen. This time, if you take out your hymnals, let's stand and sing together. Number 454, 454, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Number four.
You may be seated. Please be seated. I'd like to call your attention to a few announcements before we continue our service. First, I've just been told from Frankie to please take all the palms you want um, and uh, bring them home, give them to the kids, let them fight over them, however you want to do it. Uh, but they need to go, so please take them as you go. Uh, this week is Holy Week, as you know, and our schedule is on the bulletin here. I'd like you to turn your attention to that. Uh, there are Bible studies going on this week. Uh, Monday Precept is going on. Uh, Tuesday as well, and Wednesday is on schedule. Um, Thursday, we have a special service. It's Monday, Thursday. That is the day we remember the Last Supper of the Lord. And so we'll be up here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock, and we'll have a special communion service. It'll be a hymn sing with a meditation. It goes for about an hour or so. Uh, it's a wonderful time to reflect upon the cross and our great salvation. So that's Thursday at 7. Friday is our a service of prayer and meditation. It's not so much a service as it is that the sanctuary is open on Friday. Uh, we have some soft music playing between 12 and 3. And then every half an hour, uh, there'll be a scripture reading and uh, for people to help us to meditate upon the cross. So you're welcome to come in at any time. Just quietly come and sit, uh, meditate for however long you wish, uh, and then leave quietly as you please. If you can come for half an hour, that's fine, or 10 minutes even. If you want to stay for the full three hours, I don't think anyone's ever done that, but you're welcome to do that too. Uh, this is a chance for us to just, to just to reflect upon what Christ did, because in those three hours on Good Friday is when our Lord, the the Son of God, the glory of heaven, received all of our sin, and the sky went black, and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's in that moment that he is bearing the wrath of the Father. That's the hours of our salvation. And so it is good for us to reflect upon that. So the sanctuary will be open for that. And then Easter Sunday, 6 a.m., we are back on the beach we missed it last year, but not this year. We're going to be on the beach. Uh, Salisbury Re Reservation, over at the very end where the jetty is, where all the rocks go out into the ocean, where the river meets it, right in the corner of the parking lot. There's some benches there, uh, very easy to get to. Six o'clock, but don't be late. The service is pretty quick because it's cold. So we usually go from 6 to 6.30. And uh, 6.30, we're wrapping up. So be there. Uh, the sunrise, I hope for, it's not too cloudy. Uh, is, it's beautiful. And even when the sun is not out, it's still worth coming. So please consider that. Um, and it wouldn't be Easter if we're not just thoroughly exhausted for the entire day. So that's your goal. 6 a.m. 10 o'clock, we'll be having our regular worship service, and we're just excited. We'll be having a baptism. Uh, Jenna, who read the scripture for us today, will be getting baptized next Sunday for Easter sunrise, Sunday. So um, we're thrilled about that. So hope you can join us again. We'll be on Facebook as well as in person. That's what's happening this week. And uh, one more announcement is if you have any interest in our Christian Explored, please, please speak to me soon about that. We're going to be starting to set some dates for that. And don't forget your prayer list for this week. This is the last one of our seven weeks of prayer. Please take this home. Pray for these folks and uh, keep them in prayer. We will have gone through our, our membership and our those who've been coming and who wish to be on our list. So please... Uh, keep these people in prayer this week. Are there any other announcements this, evening, this morning? Thank you. All right, I'm going to invite uh, Ron Fuller to come forward to lead us in our time of prayer together. <clears throat> Michael touched this morning upon a scripture verse that is going to kind of lead us into our uh, prayer of supplication this morning. It was taken from... Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. And I'd like to share it with you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I would ask you this morning, why did you come to church? What would your answer be? I hope it's not, I gotta see Mary or I gotta see Bill about something. Or, you know, 
I really haven't been in a while. Easter's coming up. You know, I probably should go um, because it's probably the thing to do. But why really? Is the real reason to worship that we long for a close relationship with our Lord and we have needs that we feel can be answered? Of course it is, I hope. A scripture verse tells us to give thanks and through that time in worship, what do we most often find? Comfort and joy in our Lord. So let us go before the Lord now in a time of longing, a time of thanksgiving, and leading to a time of comfort. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do again gather this morning to worship you on this very special beginning day of Holy Week, Palm Sunday. For many of us, we have anxious hearts, a longing for something, and we seek from you that answer that we know can only come from you. Our souls are habitually fearful and troubled, but you tell us, do not be fearful, worried, or troubled by the cares of this life. Do not be anxious in everything, every sin and fearful circumstance, every cultural upheaval, every loss or gain, every slight or betrayal, every heartbreak and painful memory, every worry, everything. Turn to you in prayer. You tell us that prayer is a worship and a devotion to you. That we need to come to you with praise and thanksgiving for who you are, needing to recognize your power and authority and to know from experience that you alone are able. We need to know that as we come to you in supplication for personal needs, our lowliness and utter dependence, that we trust in you at all times, pouring out our hearts before you and that you are our refuge for us, that you will not cast out anyone who comes to you that we can tell you everything and that you know it already and yet still love us. So Lord, we come, we pour out our hearts before you, we lay our burdens on you, we weep in your arms and let you know now to restore our souls. You tell us to let our requests be made known to you. And we see through these requests that it reveals our faith in Christ and our desire for his will in our lives. Don't be afraid to ask. Our life in Christ is one of asking, always. And we know that your answers will give us joy. So it is with that joyful expectation that we make our requests known to you. And your peace is beyond emotion or circumstance, and it is that peace that will guard our hearts and minds in Christ. May we worship you, Lord, with pure devotion and humility, pouring out our hearts before you, making our requests to you in these troubled times of life. Then I pray that you will help us to enjoy the comfort and the joy that only you can bring to those that have faith in you. For it's in your name we pray, and we lift up that prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand together now and sing our doxology as we present our tithes and offerings.
Our Heavenly Father, we once again come before you, and we lift up to you with great blessings, great thankfulness, the many things that you have given to us throughout this week and throughout this year. And it's our desire, Lord, to give back to you a portion of it, that you may use it in this church to bring forth your kingdom, to bring forth the gospel to those people that so desperately need it. And we give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could take out your hymnals now and turn to our final hymn of offering, uh, hymn number 149, Praise Him, Praise Him. benediction today I'd like to share with you a very short little poem that I found uh, entitled Palm Sunday Benediction that kind of leads us into uh, what we're going into this week. And so it begins, we walk this week from palms now to passion, it's Jesus we seek. Each moment we walk through these days now with Jesus is time to see people the way Jesus sees us, to watch for the ones who need hope, who need kindness, seeking the light, not the darkness that binds us. As you walk through these days, may the love you now know be spread to each person you meet on the go. And may God, who now blesses and keeps you in love, whose face shines upon you with grace from above, who looks on you with such joy and such favor, this God, three in one, gives you peace, a life to savor. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.